Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I want to introduce you tonight to Indira Naidu Harris. Uh, she is a really quite a fascinating person. She's a former cabinet minister in the Ontario government, uh, but right now she's working at Guelph University um, on, in an area of equity and diversity. Uh, they had a big seminar recently, and I thought it would be very appropriate to check in with her, given that uh, it was uh, you know International Women's Day and uh, International Women's Month, and, uh, and and a lot of attention has been paid to uh, to issues in regards to equity and diversity. And you know, just last week, uh, President Biden came to Canada and commented uh, about how 50% of both the U.S. and Canadian cabinets are 50% uh, female. And so I think equity and diversity issues are important. Uh, Indira Naidu uh, Harris is a policymaker, a journalist, and a human rights advocate. Her areas include education, equity, diversity, inclusion, and women's issues. She was a Ontario MPP and a cabinet minister. Her files included the status of women, childcare, education, health, and finance. Uh, she advanced strategies for women's economic empowerment, gender-based violence, anti-human trafficking, free preschool childcare, and dementia. She was also a respected journalist at CBC, CTV, TVO, and Omni. In 2002, uh, she was named, 2022, she was named one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women by the Women's Executive Network. And in January 2023, she traveled to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, to advocate for gender equity and leadership and building a strong path forward. Pretty impressive background. <laughs> <laughs> you got to tell me, how did you get from journalism into politics? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think part of it has to do with my background, you know, my life experience. So as you may know, I was uh, born in Durban, South Africa under apartheid. And so uh, understanding that political systems are really important when it comes to people and building civil societies and and how we are able to be successful as individuals. And so from a young age, I always understood that. So I was always kind of interested in politics, but I wound up in journalism, wound up uh, having a lot of great chats with a lot of very interesting people over the years, uh, just like you, I'm sure, Brian. And so, you know, you start to uh, talk to people and think about things. And, uh, you know, as a journalist, sometimes you wind up in this situation where you're talking to uh, uh, politicians and you kind of push them a little bit, you know, what are you doing about this and what are you doing about that? And so uh, at some point along the way, you know, I started thinking about, okay, I keep asking these questions. What would I do, you know, if I was in that situation? And so part of my journey was to speak with folks, you know, who were in the political realm, so to speak, and get to know them a little bit and then start to really think about their answers and, and you know, how important it is to build good solid policy that really supports people and so uh, it in some ways it was kind of natural even though it may not seem like a natural path but it, it was. must have been a great experience and I want to talk to you about this uh, uh, panel discussion uh, that uh, you sponsored at the University of Guelph on diversity uh, and I also want to ask you about uh, Davos but I got to ask you just given that it was topical what did you think about uh, Biden's comment in Parliament last week that uh, you know fifty percent of the Ontario of the Canadian cabinet, fifty percent of the American cabinet were both females, and then I guess there were some uh, conservative uh, members that uh, didn't get up, and he he said, "Hey guys, even if you don't agree, stand up." Uh, and 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 some people have commented that quotas, if that's what they were, were wrong, and other people have said, "No, this is the completely right thing that uh, and something to be proud about." How did you react to that that sort of comment and discussion? Well, to me, it, to some extent, it's common sense, right? 50% of our population, our communities are women, you know, and now, of course, there's, there's much gender diversity in other ways. But 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 certainly, if you're just looking at, at sort of males and, you know, females in our community and the way, you know, uh, people who identify as, as, uh, as women and female, then uh, that's part of, that's our community, that's our population. And so why wouldn't you want to have of that reflected uh, in government, in business, and everything else. So it is important that when you're sitting at a table, that 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 table that you're at, uh, especially when you're making key decisions for for people, and uh, that 
the, that reflect that table and those voices reflect those people out there. So we're talking now about gender diversity, but I think diversity in a broader sense is also part of that conversation. So, you know, it's equity deserving groups, yeah. it, you know, women, um, you know, LGBTQ and, and uh, certainly people of color, but uh, it, the whole point is, uh, is to be reflective of the communities we serve. I want to get into uh, again the the panel in Davos in greater detail in a couple of minutes, but just you know, in summary, do you think that uh, that equality, uh, diversity, inclusion issues are 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 better today? Uh, have we moved forward or are we stalled? Well, that's an interesting question, and and there's no simple answer to that. The conversation started many years ago, you know, and certainly came to the forefront, certainly in the U.S. and and parts of Canada in the '60s, and and uh, you know when we were talking about equity and diversity and and those sorts of things, and it seemed like a lot of um, we move forward, you know, in in a really great way. There were a lot of things that changed with it, when it came to the vote, when it came to lots of uh, civil rights movements and so on, uh, certainly, uh, you know, in the States when it came to uh, uh, schools being segregated and certain areas and things like that. So the, the needle definitely moved forward and we wound up with, with human rights policies and equity policies and so on. But what's become very clear over time is that it's like a garden. It has to be tended. And unfortunately, when we wound up in a pandemic and we were all put to the test, it became very clear that some of the things that were happening in our world, our society, and our global, you know, uh, community uh, was that not everyone was uh, being included in the conversations and yeah. supports were not uh, really being built there to some extent to, to help those folks who uh, perhaps needed it most. And so, that brought this conversation back to the forefront. And then we all realized, oh, you know, we have more work to do. Absolutely. We're chatting tonight with uh, Indira Naidu Harris. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back in just two minutes uh, and chat a little bit more about uh, about a conference that, uh, and a panel discussion that she had recently at the University of Guelph on diversity and also a visit that she made to uh, Davos. I always like hearing what happened at uh, Davos or Davos, how you even pronounce it. We're back in two. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. A real pleasure of mine to uh, to check back in with someone uh, who I followed uh, when she was in uh, Ontario politics because I thought quite highly of her. And so it's interesting to, to see what happens to people when uh, sort of they graduate out of politics and, and move on to other things. Uh, my guest is Indira Naidu Harris. She is a policymaker. She's a journalist. She's a human rights advocate. She was uh, in the Ontario a government of uh, Kathleen Wynne, uh, Dalton McGinty, her files included status of women, child care, education, health and finance, uh, really quite uh, uh, an extensive uh, portfolio of different interests uh, that you've had. Um, I just got to ask you, uh, you know, you, you've been in politics, you've been a journalist, you're now, uh, you know, working at the University of Guelph. A lot has happened over the last few years. What do you think the biggest challenges facing leaders in the world today are? What, what, like, what do you think the biggest issues coming out of uh, the pandemic are that we've got to be thinking about as we rebuild our communities? Oh, my gosh. Uh, so many things to really think about, Brian. But there are some very serious challenges that people are facing, uh, not just in Ontario and uh, Canada, but all around the world. And and these challenges uh, are are huge, you know. So you've got a pandemic, which made it very clear that we have a healthcare crisis going on. At the same time, folks are becoming very aware of the fact that we have an environmental climate crisis going on, and so uh, we need to take care of folks when we think about water and and and, and you know uh, certainly climate refugees and things like that. Then, in addition to that, we have a war going on in the Ukraine right now, which is making everyone very nervous. Nervous, and certainly making folks in Europe and even here in, in North America become aware of sort of what our values are and what's at stake in some of these, uh, these uh, uh, you know, conflicts that are going on around the world. And then finally, uh, not just finally, we have the whole financial piece, right? We've, uh, we've got uh, inflation, we've got housing issues going on, we have folks uh, who are uh, really having some challenges when it comes 
comes to mental health and, and how they're going to survive that. And, and then you have equity deserving groups who are also talking to us about their challenges when it comes to human rights and, and sort of the problems that they are facing. So uh, there is a lot going on and there are a lot of these uh, challenges that have no simple answers. And so our, you know, our leaders around the world are going to have to grapple with these things in a very real way. And frankly, I think it means that they're going to have to think about solutions in a way that perhaps they haven't thought about before. You were in charge of and involved in childcare and health uh, and uh... And, and women's issues uh, when you were in government. Uh, what do you think about how the Ontario government, how the Canadian government, how to, you know leaders around the world dealt with those issues during the pandemic? Well, I think a lot of people were just struggling to uh, try to make it to the next day. You know, I, I really think that that looking at how folks were were dealing with some of the regular running of business during the pandemic, uh, you really have to be fair to the conditions that they were working under. Because on the one hand, they were trying to keep people alive, literally, you know, by by making sure that they were delivering health care and supports and services to folks that needed it, let alone there were people who were being isolated in their homes and so, you know, struggling with some of those needs. And remember, at the beginning, it was even a challenge figuring out how to get your groceries and so on. So, so you know, I think we have to cut people a little bit of slack there. But having said that, you know, there were some very important pieces, certainly that uh, our federal government moved forward with uh, that I thought was important, not just for that moment in time, but really in terms of supporting our workforce and our, you know, not and our families, but again, not just our families, but building that foundation for business in our in our province, in our country, and really around the world. And, and childcare is such a huge enabler when you come to allowing people who want to work, who are ready to work, who want to support their their families, uh, the ability to do that and not be concerned about their children, but but be able to support their families uh, while they're working. You know, the the day of of you know one parent being able to stay at home while the other one worked. Uh, it's not really that simple anymore. You know, housing costs are rising. There are a lot of folks out there where you need to have both people working just in order to put food on the table, let alone a roof over, uh, you know, a family's head. And so um, this is an important foundational piece to allowing people the ability or giving them the ability to be able to survive during challenging times. And, and uh, that's why I felt for a long time that childcare uh, in our province, in the country and around the world is an extremely important conversation and one that isn't just about families, it's about building a solid uh, future for all of us. I interviewed uh, someone a couple of weeks ago that was just graduating from grade 12. And uh, for the vast majority, of their high school career, they didn't have extracurricular activities. They didn't have football, they didn't have soccer, they didn't have student council, they didn't have debate clubs, stuff like that, because of the pandemic. Um, did we make a mistake in, uh, in closing down our schools? All honesty, that's not a question for me to answer. I think, you know, we had to rely on the advice of our health experts that who were out there. And frankly, you know, I think they did the best they could with the information that they were getting at the time. I mean, remember, there was some conflicting information that was coming out also, you know, uh, but certainly you had the World Health Organization guiding things in some ways. You had researchers saying things and then, you know, like all good research and, uh, and, and, and important conversations, you know, while there are folks that agree, there are always some folks that say, hey, but what about this and what about that? And at the end of the day, I think it was important that we went to the experts or those folks who we had appointed as experts to guide us through this uh, very challenging time. And frankly, something that we, my generation and, and most of us hadn't uh, ever had to experience before. And I don't think uh, that this is uh, a time for us to reconsider that or think about what we could have done and what should have been done. Having said that, I, uh, you know, I have no doubt that it was challenging for for young people and for for all of us. Right. So those years of isolating and not being able to communicate uh, definitely had an impact on uh, 
on our individuals, on families, on our communities, you know, and even today, if you go out to a busy, uh, a busy event or something, in fact, I've had to do that a few times in the last little while, you know, there's a moment where you're sort of, you know, trying Should to I put that mask on or not. Yeah. And also trying to figure out how to be social. You know, it's it's like some of those skills are gone. So think about those young people who are just starting to grow, you know, and starting to find their voice and try, starting to figure out who they are. And you know this. I mean, we, I, I wouldn't want to be a teenager again, but it's not easy, let alone think about how are you going to do that, you know, on your laptops and and trying to distance from folks. Uh, a very challenging time, but a, cha yeah. a time... Yeah that we all had to get through. You know, I, I hear you about how challenging the time was and we all had to get through it and that, you know, you may not want to go back and rethink what uh, all those decisions were. That said, I think we need to. Um, you know, after the SARS uh, epidemic in uh, in the early 2000s, uh, we did have a judicial inquiry in Ontario that went through and, and analyzed uh, what went wrong and what went right. And, uh, you know, some of the things that were decided is that and that were never implemented or never implemented correctly in regards to uh, uh, ensuring that, <laughs> excuse me, you know, workers didn't go from seniors home to seniors home to seniors home, uh, that there were full time employees and that uh, there was a, a stock holding of PP uh, personal protective equipment and that there were ventilators. And there were a lot of suggestions made that we didn't follow up on um, and that uh, ended up uh, being a problem uh, in this pandemic. So I do think that we should we should give some thought to what went right, what went wrong, such that if there is another, um, you know, big outbreak, another virus, another, another pandemic, uh, we uh, we can we can analyze it and uh, and be prepared, better prepared to to respond to it. Anyway, and if I if I can tell you, I'm with a university right now, and and that kind of research is definitely being done and and undertaken by folks, you know, out there Excellent. in the, in in the post secondary world, and and it's an important conversation and important research. You were close to leaders. You were close to a lot of different uh, leaders and leadership traits uh, when you were in politics and probably when you were in journalism, uh, covering people. What do you think the style of leadership is that we need right now, given some of the economic challenges, given some of the health challenges, given some of the inflation challenges uh, that we have? What type of style of leader do we need? Well, and I think that's a really great question and an important question at this point in time for all of us, right? Uh, you know, the old days, there was a sort of top-down way of leading. You know, you had a leader that would come along and and they were supposed to be decisive and they were supposed to kind of, you know, tell folks that this is what we were going to do and this is how we were going to do it and, 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 and you know, uh, be a little more traditional sort of in their outlook in terms of how they managed people and how they got things done, you know? my way or the highway in some ways, I think that that some people operated. Um, one of the things that the pandemic and the recent uh, crises that we've all had to face uh, has shown us is that we're really, we're not completely prepared to deal with this uh, crisis, certainly the global pandemic. It wasn't something that we'd predicted uh, very, very strongly at that point in time. And so we were all caught off guard and trying to figure things out. And then, as I mentioned, as we went through that and wound up in our own um, homes, you know, working and socially isolated and, and that sort of thing, uh, we wound up discovering that there were a lot of folks that were dealing with a tremendous amount of uh, pressure in their own lives. And so certainly I've mentioned before equity deserving groups who had, uh, you know, further challenges and so on. So what kind of a leader do we need now as we're coming out of this? Well, mental health issues are huge, right? Folks are kind of struggling to try to manage uh, their households and also the future. We need people who are going to come up with, uh, you know, uh, uh, really uh, very, very uh, uh, out of uh, out of the box kinds of solutions. You know, we we need thinkers who are going to really be thinking out of the box and not in the way that we have been thinking before. Because at the end of the day, that's the kind of uh, those are the folks that we need at the table. So, what kind of leadership do we need right now? I think we need thoughtful, 
careful leadership. I think we need people who, yes, do lead, but spend time talking to their teams, spend more time consulting with folks, and spend time really making sure that people are okay. So to a large extent, a sort of kinder, thoughtful uh, leadership, and one that is really taking into account all of the voices in our communities and, and have those voices reflected at their tables. Because at the end of the day, the only way you come up with innovative solutions is by making sure that you have a collection of innovative thinkers sitting at the table. If everybody at the table all thinks the same thing, you're not going to come up with, you know, some uh, uh, problem solving that is going to be outside of the box. So we need to really open up how we approach those people who are at the table and then also how we treat the folks uh, that we are working with uh, is a very important part of how we build a strong path forward in the next little while and strong teams. I wonder if that's the kind of leadership that we're actually getting, but I'm not going to ask you that. Um, <laughs> your office told me that uh, that uh, uh, teams, management teams, executive teams, boards, uh, et cetera, that have more women as part of them actually have better performance. Do you really believe that? Is it true? There have been studies that support that. And so it's it's not a matter of belief or not believing. At the end of the day, we do have to uh, pay attention to what the research shows. And the research has been there for many years. So certainly Catalyst has been doing research in this area. McKinsey has also been doing research in this area. Uh, the Columbus Business School uh, uh, professor, Catherine Phillips, says, you know, diversity jolts uh, folks into cognitive action in ways that homogeneity simply doesn't doesn't, you know, to quote someone. Really, that's that, interesting. Okay, given that quote yeah. again, diversity jolts people into positive action that homogeneity doesn't. Homogeneity. So uh, what she said essentially was that uh, diversity jolts into cognitive action in ways that homogeneity simply does not. And what a great uh, this quote. is yeah, it is a great quote. quote. It's Catherine Phillips from the Columbia Business School, and she's a prof there. But that is just one voice. Uh, and there are many voices that, that talk about this uh, sort of thing. You know, even the Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council says that having a diverse leadership team has a positive impact and positive financial return. Deloitte says that um, organizations with inclusive cultures are eight times more likely to achieve better business outcomes, including increased productivity, growth, profitability, employee engagement, and loyalty. And it goes on and on. I mean, I mentioned McKinsey. Uh, they reported that companies at the top for gender, racial, and ethnic diversity are more likely to have financial returns above their national industry median. So, median. So, you know, the research is there. It's interesting that it's just taking a long time for folks to really get it, you know, and and start uh, using that research as they build their teams because uh, because the studies are there, the surveys are there to support yeah. them. The, the, the line that I like using uh, quite a bit is diversity is a fact, inclusion is a choice, um, or, uh, you know, you're included when uh, you're not, uh, you're not just invited to the dance, but you're invited to actually dance. Um, how do you get leaders to actually take action and uh, get the job done from a diversity and inclusion standpoint? Well, that is a, a really great question. And I think part of that, you know, it, it's going to sound sort of boring, but it has to be about conversations. The good news is that uh, uh, leaders, large organizations, governments are pay paying attention to uh, EDI. So the importance of equity, diversity and inclusion. You know, a lot of major companies now are adopting policies and making sure that they are building this into the narrative and the foundation of the work that they're doing. So they're recognizing that this is a very important way to have a successful workforce, right? So, you know, while it's the right thing to do, the research, as I said, also says and supports this notion that uh, it's the right thing to do and it will also deliver results. So we're at a crossroads, I think, in so many ways as, as a nation and, and uh, certainly as a province when we're looking at how we're going to be more successful because it's people coming out of the pandemic. It's a very competitive world out there right now. Right. I mean, 
Canada is competing with a lot of other countries globally. So th this isn't a time for us to start thinking about, well, inclusion, you know, am I, how am I going to do that? Or, you know, folks kind of figuring out how important it is to them. It's absolutely important when you're building your workforce and trying to create a successful future. We know that it is. So it's time for us to just start accepting that and, and doing it. And so, yes, conversations, um, education, for sure, uh, training. Uh, uh, so companies should be building, bringing in folks to do that training with their senior leadership teams. You know, I did it at the U of G. Uh, you know, we happen to have an amazing uh, president, Charlotte Wa Yates, who who insisted on her entire leadership team, senior leadership team, being trained when it came to uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and and the principles of belonging, so to speak, and why it's important to uh, to have your your leadership teams understand that this is an important part of the narrative and, and the structure moving forward. I do think it is a huge uh, potential success for Canadian companies and, and, and companies in the greater Toronto where, where we have such diversity in our diversity, uh, unlike almost anywhere else in the world. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting today with Indira Naidu Harris, policymaker, journalist, human rights advocate, former cabinet minister in the uh, Ontario Liberal government, uh, currently working at uh, the University of Guelph. Uh, I got to ask you, you went to uh, Davos. That's like, you know, this big deal, the World Economic Forum. What did you do there? What did uh, you were representing diversity and equity uh, interests? Uh, like, what was it all about? Well, thanks for asking. I uh, wound up going with an interesting team. Uh, um, I was asked to go and, and accompany them at Davos. And it was um, a team that was presenting at the uh, sustainability and development uh, uh, as part of the sustainability and development goals initiative at Davos. And so, you know, it was an incredible experience for me, Brian, absolutely incredible. And that particular group was working on uh, pointing out uh, why gender diversity was import important when you're looking at leadership teams, why, uh, you know, the things you and I are talking about right now, right? Why it's important to have everybody at the table. And so while, you know, the conversation was about what makes uh, gender diverse leadership uh, a key way of moving forward versus, versus sort of traditional leadership and traditional leadership uh, uh, approaches, it was also about the unique um the unique characteristics that uh, a gender diverse team brings. So, you know, women uh, come already with a certain lens if we're going to talk about women. But the, the group that I went to Davos uh, talked about that this isn't just something about uh, women versus men. This is really about women uh, uh, having a unique perspective, but that perspective is something that's needed now, but it's a perspective that we all have. I mean, even you and I are talking about this, it's not just women. It's that we need to tap into that sort of kinder, softer, uh, um, a more thoughtful way of approaching leadership because that's what's needed right now. And so the World Economic Forum was amazing. Uh, you know, the conversation was about how do we deal with poly crisis? And you know what are some of the risks that are out there, and how do we uh, how do we take care of some of these things? You know, the cost of living crisis, as we talked about, the climate crisis, uh, and, and uh, you know finite resources, all of those things are putting lots of pressure on folks, you know, geopolitical stuff and economic trends, and how do we come up with good solutions? And it was about, we need to harness the power of people. That's what I was there to talk about. And I was uh, privileged to be uh, giving the keynote address at a dinner actually, where I talked about my own experiences in life, but also why I, I thought uh, this is an important moment in time and that we have to start thinking about how we bring everybody to the table. And so it was really uh, a very energizing experience for me and one that I walked away with really feeling like I had a lot of faith in humanity and the people that I had the opportunity to meet there because they were there to roll up their sleeves and really talk about how we could do that. The group I was there with was called Unlocking Eve, and it was a group that was really 
pushing forward this notion that uh, we all have these characteristics, whether we're male or female or gender neutral, the characteristics of leadership, of also kindness and thoughtfulness and, and all the other things that we need uh, when it comes to uh, being strong leaders. And that part of the approach in the future has to be uh, figuring out how to tap into this and recognizing that traditional leadership uh, styles uh, are out of date, really. And, and we need to increase productivity, growth, profitability, employment, you know, engagement, loyalty, all of those things uh, come about with the right kind of leadership, not where you shut down voices, but where you open up voices, whether, you know, you're in the boardroom or, uh, you know, in cabinet uh, politically. It's about allowing everyone to have a seat at the table and, and, and encouraging them to speak. That's so important because you can have people at the table, but if they're too scared to speak, you're not going to get that information. You're not going to get those, those ideas that will really take that conversation forward. If you make people feel like they maybe shouldn't say something or their idea is, you know, not welcome, crazy, whatever you want to call it. They're not going to say what they really think. And at the end of the day, we're not going to come up with perhaps that key bit of information that can inform uh, us to the next step and, and help us find that innovative solution that can solve one of the biggest problems in the world, you know, whether it has to do with a climate cr crisis or a geopolitical crisis, you know, that's why we need everyone with their very varying experiences, their backgrounds, all of that. That's what counts. That's how you wind up uh, coming up with innovative solutions. Okay, okay, okay. You know, what you say sounds fantastic, but it sounds pretty darn idealistic. With all of our populist, uh, uh, authoritarian kind of leaders that we've got right now worldwide, do you really believe what you're talking about is what's needed and, and, and is possible and what people really want? Well, one of the things that the Unlocking T Eve team uh, discovered was they, they actually started embarking on this because they looked at how folks were dealing with uh, the healthcare care crisis during the global pandemic. And one of the things that their research showed was that some of the communities and countries that were doing really well when it came to, uh, you know, keeping their people uh, safe and providing those health care options and so on was that they had strong leadership and specifically in a lot of instances instances, uh, women at the table, you know, as part of that conversation, you know, a lot of our health care, a lot of the people on the ground in delivering health care to all of us are women, they're nurses, they're, you know, personal support workers and so on. And but what they noticed is that these individuals weren't always able to move up the pipeline. And so part of that was definitely about gender and getting more women to be at the table. But they also discovered that, you know, uh, folks like um, uh, the uh, Prime Minister, of New Zealand, you know, uh, Jacinda Ardern, she was there and she uh, had done some very innovative things and come up with some innovative solutions. So there are those folks out there that are doing some of these things, yeah. men and not women, many. but not many. And so this is how we do it, isn't it? I mean, you great opportunity. Me and we getting out there and telling people that this is the new world and this is how we have to think. What a great opportunity that you got to uh, speak at a dinner and uh, share some of your own personal experiences with this. Tell us what what personal experiences you shared, if you could. Uh, the personal experiences I shared, uh, some of them were, you know, um, were were you know, very emotional for me, frankly, because uh, I was born in Durban, South Africa, as I mentioned earlier, under apartheid. I was a child when my family decided to leave South Africa, and we we had to get out, uh, get out of that situation. It, it actually wasn't easy, but we wound up coming to Canada where there were human rights and we were welcomed uh, in, you know, in an amazing way. But I never forgot what it was like to not have a voice and literally in my lifetime in my own experience Brian, hard to believe, but as a child, I was not allowed to go into some restaurants. I was not allowed, believe it or not, to, you know, I saw um, 
bus benches. You know, when you're sitting waiting for the bus that I wasn't allowed to sit on with my mom, I saw buses that I wasn't allowed to get into. It is hard to imagine today, but that was absolutely part of the reality in that country at that time. Of course, uh, South Africa's moved forward and Mandela was such an important part of making that happen. But seeing people suffer when they were not allowed to have a voice and not being able to have the vote instilled in me this um, commitment to making sure that I was going to do everything I could to make sure that people understood how important it was to be inclusive, to create a place where people belonged. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about hardship, it's about tragedy, it's about trauma, it's about so many other things, and you create a dysfunctional society. We live in Canada where you know, I have been allowed to not just, you know, wind up on television, you know, during my broadcast years as a journalist, but, you know, also become an elected member and, and really be able to have those opportunities that I never would have had as a child. I wasn't even allowed to vote, let alone, you know, come to Canada and run an election campaign and, and, and be uh, an elected member of provincial parliament. I have never forgotten uh, how lucky I am and how proud I am to be Canadian. And so when I went to Davos, I talked about how we needed to get people understanding that this is an important time for all of us, where we all need to work a little harder to 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 get all of those folks a, at the table. What a great experience. Uh, let me ask you one last question before I lose you. Um, you were a cabinet minister. Um, we've got an upcoming uh, leadership campaign for the Ontario Liberal Party for a leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. Many people think that uh, that person could become Premier of Ontario. We've got a mayoralty election in Toronto. What kind of leader do you think that we need in, uh, in Ontario? Well, that's a really important question and a great one. Uh, you know, as I pointed out, there are so many problems and um, real difficulties that people are facing right now. And and our leaders really have to recognize that uh, the path forward is going to be a slightly different one from the one in the past, right? And frankly, I think the voter wants a different kind of leader. You know, it, it, it's hard at this point to figure out exactly what they want, but I think it's fair and safe to say that uh, the old kind of leadership isn't gonna cut it. People want to find someone that they feel they can relate to, someone who understands the challenges that they faced, someone who may not come across as being perfect per se, but someone who they feel they can trust. That's what they need. And someone who is going to be thoughtful and at the end of the day is going to be kind. So to listen to people, to listen to what they have, uh, what their needs are, and then explain to them what we can and can't do and do it in a way that is sincere and in a way that recognizes that they can't do everything. You know, trying to find a leader who comes in and says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to solve your all, all your problems, is just not going to cut it anymore because that's not the world we live in. We live in a very, uh, you know, challenging time. And so we need leaders that uh, recognize that and say, guess what? I know this is a difficult time. I'm going to do the best I can. You tell me where you want my priorities to be. You tell me what you want on for, to work on first, and I will do my best to deliver that, recognizing that uh, resources are limited, but I will do the best I can. That's what people want to hear from a leader, I think. I hope you're right. I worry that you're very idealistic in, uh, in your attitude, but I hope you're right. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure chatting with you too, Brian. Thank you so much for inviting me. I didn't get a chance to thank you for that. And thank you so much for uh, having me uh, be a voice on your radio station and your program. And I hope your listeners uh, appreciated some of our conversation. I certainly enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm not going to ask if you're going to run uh, in the leadership, but uh, we'll leave <laughs> that for, uh, for next time. Anyway, Indira Naidu Harris, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to take a final break and come back with some concluding comments in just two minutes, everybody. Stay with us.